This lecture looks at VLANs and gives an introduction to some of the fundamental areas related to VLANs. One of the most basic concepts is the idea of a broadcast domain and it's the thing that makes the internet so dynamic in that hosts can join the internet and it's ARP that allows other nodes to be able to find them for the last part of the network. Basically, if one node wants to find the MAC address of another node that it knows its IP address, it sends a broadcast ARP packet to the whole of the network subnet. So in this case, all these nodes will receive the ARP packet where this node asks for the MAC address of this node. When this node detects that it is its IP address, it returns back only to the node which requested it, its MAC address. When that happens, the, MAC address, the ARP table on the host that asked for the MAC address will update its ARP table. In this way, we can dynamically add and delete computers from the network. After a while, the address mapping is aged out of the ARP cache and the host must re-ask for it. So if a node goes offline, then it will it will need to be requested again. Basically, a network bridge, which works at layer 2, will forward any broadcasts on to another network. And basically, any node with inside the broadcast domain can see any other node and find it. So a bridge extends a network segment. A router, on the other hand, will block any ARP and broadcast traffic. So these nodes cannot communicate directly and find each other's MAC address. There is also no need for it. It is up to the router to be able to route the, the traffic. Repeaters also extend network segment, basically cleaning up the signals, multiplying the signal strength and resynchronizing. The bridge also in this case will forward ARP broadcasts along here too, but it will be stopped by this port. Also, the router only forwards for a network segment which is on that segment. If we see here the extent of a broadcast domain, we see nodes A to K. A and B are in the same broadcast domain because the broadcast will be bound, stopped by this port on the router. A hub forwards broadcasts so it will go to C, it will also go to E, but it will be blocked by this port here. F will go through the switch, the switch will forward on through the bridge to G and also to H, but the broadcast will be stopped here. And the repeater also forwards, so it forwards it to the switch, which connects to J and K, but is bounded here. So the ARP, ARP only applies with inside the broadcast domain. Nodes with inside that broadcast domain can connect directly to other nodes because they can actually discover them with inside the broadcast domain. Here we see a hub and the hub connects the broadcasts. Okay, so how does the internet actually work and how is it that computers can add and delete themselves from the internet and other destination nodes can find them? Well, basically, when this machine wants to talk to this machine, 
This machine does not need to know the MAC address of the destination. It would be too difficult for it to find that out. So basically what it does is it puts its own IP address in the source and the destination IP address of the destination node. Then it adds its own source MAC address and through ARP it has already discovered the MAC address of the gateway. So the first data frame that goes out has the destination MAC address of the gateway port of the router. The router then knows the best route to get to the destination. It will then forward the data frame over, this time using the source MAC address here and the destination MAC address of the next gateway. Again, the IP address doesn't actually change. Then this router then forwards that on and the data frame that's transmitted has a source MAC address of MAC5 and a destination of MAC6. Only when it gets to the last network does the actual MAC address of the destination node need to be resolved. In this case, we can then communicate directly with this host because we have the correct details for its MAC address and for its IP address. And it's this magical last segment where we can resolve the MAC address that makes the whole thing work. So typically we go through the, the internet using routers. Each router typically takes up to layer 3 and then forwards on. So the key thing that any node, when they wish to get out of a, of a local network, is to broadcast for the default gateway MAC address. So typically, the IP address of the gateway is defined on, on the computer. And then an ARP is used to discover the MAC address. Once those are determined, then it is possible for the host to be able to connect to an external network. Basically, ARP here allows the gateway to determine the MAC address of the actual destination. Same again for the intermediate devices. They discover each of the gateway MAC addresses by an ARP. So ARPs stay with inside each of their subdomains. OK, so let's look at one of the most basic levels of security and that's layer 2 security looking at VLANs or virtual LANs. So what is a virtual LAN? A virtual LAN involves creating a logical network. In this case all these nodes connect to the same switch but we can segment them so that certain ports connect to a one VLAN and other ports connect to another VLAN. The two networks cannot communicate directly through the switch. So in this case we have PC9, 16 and a server connected to one VLAN. This defines the scope of the broadcast domain. And then PC1, 8 and server 1 connect to another VLAN. So in this case we can apply security at the, at the very lowest level. So why do we use VLANs? Well, VLANs allows us to create networks across multiple switches. We can see here that these machines need to be connected together in, a, in one LAN, but this machine connects to a different switch. Through trunking, it is possible for us to span VLANs across switches. So now, the, even though these three machines connect to the same switch, they are not connected to the same network. Again, VLAN 2, we can span across the various switches. What we need is a trunking backbone. And basically what will happen when a broadcast happens from one node, it will be sent to all other nodes in the VLAN and not to another VLAN so it will be sent across the trunking route to the other switch. Same again, uh, a broadcast here will be sent to this node through the trunk and then also to that node. 
So an example of VLANs are, is implemented in a switch or in a Cisco Aeronet. So the advantage of VLANs is that we can set up micro-segmentation where we can split the bandwidth up into smaller and smaller elements. We have enhanced security where we can isolate one part of the network from another even though machines connect to the same switch. We can relocate servers away from local machines and put them into places like server farms but the hosts still stay connected as if they were connecting to a local LAN and it allows us to create subnets very easily. Along with this we can create virtual networks and it should help to ease administration in that we can move resources wherever we require them. Along with this it improves the bandwidth usage as network traffic stays within a certain work group. If we have a great deal of local traffic such as to servers or disk farms we can keep it local with inside the same VLAN and it doesn't affect other VLANs. Okay so let's see how we configure our VLANs. Basically there are two types a static VLAN where nodes are permanently assigned to a VLAN typically depending on the port that they actually connect to. We can also have dynamic VLANs where a, a user or a certain machine no matter which port on the switch they connect to they will still connect to the same VLAN. For this we need a database which defines uh, the VLAN that, that users or nodes connect to. Typically it detects a MAC address to assign the, the VLAN. Static LANs are, are, are extremely secure uh, and they need to make sure that a certain machine connects to a certain port. So for static VLAN what we have here are two nodes that connect to the same VLAN and we have two other nodes which connect to the second VLAN. These ones connect to VLAN 1 and these ones to VLAN 2. So what we do is that we create our VLAN. VLAN 1 is normally created anyway but we create it with interface VLAN 1 and we enable it with no shutdown. We create VLAN 2 and again we enable it. Now we can assign each of the ports to the VLAN. So switch port access VLAN 1 We'll assign this port to VLAN 1. For the third port, we assign that to VLAN 1. So now these two machines are in the same VLAN and commu can communicate directly. These two machines are then, these two interfaces are then connected to VLAN 2. So these two can now communicate. If we try to ping from this machine, to that machine we can see that it is successful but if we try to ping from this machine to this machine then it is unsuccessful as we can see here. The only way that these two devices can actually communicate is through a layer 3 device. The basic VLAN types that we have is that we can allocate it by port on the switch. We can define MAC based VLAN depending on the MAC address it will assign it to a certain VLAN. We can define it for protocols such as IP or IPX. In a wireless system which has multiple SSIDs we can assign each SSID to a certain VLAN that allows us to span across various aeronets and still connect to the same VLAN and we can also have ATM VLANs for uh, switching ATM cells. In a, in a dynamic VLAN system we need an MPLS server typically run on a 6000 series switch and this device actually contains the database which maps the MAC addresses to the VLAN numbers. 
So in this case, we define our VLAN and we give it an address. The reason we give it an address is it's so that we can access it remotely to be able to configure it. Then we say that the VLAN allocation is dynamic for the two ports that we have here, one and two. And then we define the VMPS server. In this case is the dot two machine, which is the switch. As this is so important, if there was a failure on the switch, then we typically define a secondary VMPS server. So in this case, this is the primary and the system will try this switch first. If we define a secondary, then it would go to the other machine. We can have a reconfirm and a number of retries. Uh, if it doesn't manage to contact it, it will try again uh, for, for up to three times. The reconfirm will go back every 60 minutes in this case and reconfirm the allocation of the VLAN just in case that it's been allocated to another VLAN. So these these, config, these uh, commands define the VMPS server for reconfig and retry. And then when we say show VMPS, it shows us the, the basic details of the VMPS server. On the v VMPS server, we typically have our configuration on a TFTP server. And when uh, the machine is is, is booted, it loads up the, VM, the VMPS file, defines the domain, and then defines the mapping of, in this case, the VLAN name staff is allocated to this IP address, this MAC address, and students is allocated to this MAC address. So in this way, we can allocate our, our VLANs in terms of a VLAN name. So with InterVLAN, we need to be able to send our VLAN information across a trunking route so that we can join up our nodes across multiple switches. So we typically reserve two, one port on each switch purely for a trunking route. We can also do layer three with a layer two, layer three switch so that this machine can actually talk to this machine, but only through a layer three uh, interface. And at layer three, we typically define firewall rules to either block or allow traffic at layer three. We can see here an example of between a switch and an aeronet, where we can have various SSIDs. In this case, this machine connects to VLAN one SSID. This is VLAN two. Then through the switch, we can map up machines that are connecting to a fixed network and become part of the same VLAN. Okay, so let's look at some more VLANs. The trunking protocol that's used is 802.1Q. 802.1Q is enabled to, to allow the trunking to happen. And basically, it adds extra information onto the data frame, which tags the VLAN that the node is, is in. So we have a normal data frame. It goes through the switch. One queue adds this extra information to define the VLAN, goes across the trunking route. The switch picks it up, strips off the VLAN information, and then is sent to the required node within that VLAN. So the, basically the way that it's done is that in the Ethernet frame we have some preamble, a destination MAC address, source MAC address, and then we have Ethernet type. At the end we have a, a basic check sequence. Then in between we have some data in here, which can be up to about 1500 bytes long. About 15, 16, 1516 bytes is the, around the maximum length of a data frame. So when we carry ARP traffic, we should see the value of the hexadecimal value of 0806. If it's an IP packet, 0800. 
if it's a 1Q tagged, we should see the ether type of 1800. So we can see here an, an example. This is an, is an IP data packet with inside our Ethernet frame. So here we see the destination MAC address. Here we see the source MAC address. And then we get an ether type of 0800, which is an IP packet. So the way the encapsulation is done is that if we have our, our ether, ether type of 1Q, then the bit that comes after it is then added. We can have eight levels of user priority, a CFI bit, and then we can have a 12-bit VLAN number. 12 bits allows us to create between 0 and 4095 VLANs. So the maximum number of VLANs that we can have on a site is 4096, which should be enough for any network. The Ethernet type is then just added at the end of this, so that when the data frame is recovered at the other side, the red parts are taken off and it recovers the original Ethernet frame that originated on the original network. So this is defined as an encapsulated data frame. So we can see here uh, the another method is an ILS ISL trunk and this is less used these days because this is a Cisco derived protocol and it doesn't embed into the Ethernet frame as 1Q does. Uh, but it it adds an extra header. For compatibility reasons, this is also supported on many switches. We can see here when we define our trunk, we say encapsulation and we can make it 1Q, ISL, or it can negotiate between the switches on the best type of encapsulation used. So how do we trunk between our VLANs? So in this case we have two nodes connected to one switch, two nodes to another switch, and we're using the third port on each switch as a trunk. So we set up a, an uh, a connection between the two on those ports. So we can see here that we define that our two VLANs, and we can assign them with different IP addresses to be able to communicate with them. Port 1 and port 2 on this switch are used as layer 2 access. And then layer, uh, then the third port is encapsulated with 1Q. It then defines the native uh, VLAN, which means that the the, the data frames are not tagged and then it defines the, the VLANs that are allowed to be trunked. And in this case it's non-negotiable. So now we have a trunking route between the two VLANs. If we wanted to assign this one to VLAN 1, then we would use the VLAN assignment here for VLAN 1 and then here for VLAN 2. So this shows uh, an example of uh, VLANs. We would set up on this Aeronet trunking route to the switch, trunk here and a trunk here, and then all these nodes can connect to the same VLAN. So in a wireless access point, we can define the SSID that, that we're going to allocate. In this case, we have an SSID of Scotland. We assign that to VLAN 1. And for England, we assign it to VLAN 2. And then what we do is that we define a sub-interface for these VLANs, which provides two virtual interfaces and we say for 
the radio port dot one the encapsulation is one q and the same again for the other radio face interface we have a, a dot two sub interface and that's allocated to the second VLAN. So nodes which connect to this this SSID will be allocated to VLAN one and for this SSID will be allocated to VLAN two. Then when we look at our LAN VLAN information with inside the Aeronet, we can see that uh, we have two virtual interfaces for our, our connections using 1Q encapsulation. On the switch, in this case we set up our two VLANs and we create them here. There's no need to allocate an IP address uh, if we don't need to access it remotely. And then, in this case, the first port is allocated as a, as a trunking port. Uh, the second one for trunking and the third one for trunking. So it trunks in between the internets. Okay, so this is, is a similar example, VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. And this shows our encapsulation. An important protocol that is used in switching is VDP. And VDP is important as it radiates it radiates information about VLANs across the trunk routes so that it is possible to discover the whole of a, a network and find out where VLANs are across these trunks. So VDP also allows us to be able to add and delete and change uh, VLANs with inside uh, a domain. So to create this, we create our VLAN database. To find the name of the, the domain and whether our device is a is a server or not. Various applications of VLANs, as we've seen, we can connect wireless access points into the same VLAN as we have here. Then we can have layer two, layer three switching in between so that we can actually interconnect devices through the layer 3 switch or we can block communications at, at layer 3 and that's the end of this presentation